work, then let me just refresh shortly its biographical data for the new students. Richard Mayer received his architectural training at Cornell University, he establishes his own office in New York City in 62E, and since that time his private practice work has included residence, housing, medical facilities, museums, and other cultural facilities, commercial and industrial buildings, and town plans. Among these buildings is Twin Parks Northeast Housing, Smith House, West Beth Artist Housing, Douglas House, and Brock's Development Center have won National Honor Awards from the American Institute of Architects. Mr. Meyer has received many other awards for his work, including the Arnold Brunner Memorial Prize from the National Institute of Arts and Letters in 72, the Reynolds Memorial Award in 77, awards from Architectural Record, and the 79 Progressive Archite Architecture Award for the recently completed Ateneum in New Harmony, Indiana. In spring 80, he won an international competition for, the Frankfurt, for Frankfurt, West Germany's new museum for the decorative arts. Mr. Mai was an adjunct professor of architecture at Copper Union from 64 to 73. William Henry Bishop visiting professor at Yale University in 75 and 77, and visiting professor of architecture at Harvard University in 77 and 1881. His work has been published internationally in many periodicals and books. A monograph on his work was published by Oxford University Press in 76. His projects, furniture, paintings, collage, and uh, architectural drawings have been exhibited widely, and he has lectured extensively on architecture through the US and in Europe and Japan. Mr. Meyer became a fellow of the American Institute of Architects in 76, and in 80 received a, med a Medal of Honor from the New York chapter of the American Institute of Architects. Let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Richard May. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Do the people standing want to sit down? Yeah. There are a few chairs scattered around. I'm going to talk for a long time. You may want to sit. <clears throat> I'm, I'm really very pleased uh, to be here today to discuss several of my more recent projects and to reflect on some of the inclinations aims and implications of my work. I promised some of the students this afternoon that as an introduction to a discussion of my work, uh, I would present to you a kind of nutshell summation of the state of the art of architecture. I can claim no objectivity in this endeavor. I bring to it a mind burdened with bias and a dangerous proximity to the issues. I have not the cool distance and consideration of the critic. My comments are heated, are, are really conditioned by the heat of, of close involvement and strong beliefs. And with that grain of salt, word of warning, I feel that I can proceed with more or less impunity. Pluralism, eclecticism, populism, postmodernism, all the isms abroad today in architecture speak of the breakdown of the ideological base of the modern movement. Some would say that we have happily escaped the specter of modernist dogma, the huge 
petrifying responsibility of making a better world through architecture. Some would say that finally we have liberated our art, secured its autonomy, wrestled it from, at, from enslavement to uh, utopian determinism, an enslavement that seems unreal and inappropriate and which has proven disastrous more often than not. The great faith in the miracle of technology and the great faith in the architect as a provider of global solutions is dead. Essentially, what this means is that the specific subject of our art has changed. It's no longer the ideal, the future, but the real, the present and the past. If one thinks of architecture as the treatment of meaningful forms, then the rigorous absolutism of modernism looms as a period in which many fundamental meanings were forgotten or prescribed. It's the aim of this new pluralism to make the totality of significant human experience potentially available again. In this way, history becomes a dimension of fundamental importance. The revival of the neoclassical tradition is essential to the new wave in architecture. Postmodernism, a remarkably uninformative name which covers a multitude of styles. They do have certain things in common. In the language of elements and meaningful forms, architecture can be seen as a commentary on the condition of man in relation to his object world. The basic difference between the postmodernists and their modernist progenitors comes from attitudes about the expressive didactic role of architecture. Whether the architecture should speak to man about to man about man or about architecture, about the object itself. Within the neoclassical tradition, the architect used forms that referred to man's physical reality. The building had a foot, body, and head. The architecture subsumed the object within the man-nature relationship. Modernism, with its technological liberation and abhorrence of the past, sought to differentiate man from nature, man from machine, machine from nature. This new abstraction let the building speak for itself. It was an abstraction that celebrated the potential realization of a condition of objecthood that served man but was distinct from him. Modernism strived for a primal statement. In it, all elements are reduced to raw material, dehistoricized, in order to become reconstituted as structure. That is not to say that modernism did not deploy both archetypal and historical references in its symbolism, but it was never representational. Essentially, postmodernism is a return to the neoclassical tradition, to the representational in architecture. It's a return to the anthropomorphic notion of architecture as a reflection or image of man himself. It's an architecture as a vehicle of expression for meanings and evocation of memory. At its best, this can mean an architecture of rich collage, a complex layering of meaning, symbol, and metamorphic imagery. At its worst, 
it becomes a literal reading of historical quotes and allusions which are ultimately either so accessible that they become uninteresting or so esoteric that they become unintelligible. The danger of this is that it reduces architecture to a jabber of styles, a process of mere packaging. This is a world in which there are no standards, no good or bad. Everything and anything is acceptable. Under the postmodernist umbrella is found a multitude of directions. These range from an espousal of the incoherent and illogical clothed in the commonplace, a kind of chaotic game in which rules are never really established and order is nowhere to be found, to subtle and complicated linguistic play that sets up its own cerebral and labyrinthine structure. In between, we find the romance of the familiar, the adulation of the everyday, the messiness and disorder of life, scorned by the modernists, are catapulted to a place of honor. We're to learn from the pop idols and the instant aesthetics of the highways. We're to look to McDonald's and Caesar's Palace for inspiration. Architecture is no longer seen as timeless, but it's a furial, it's a throwaway, subject to the caprice of commercial culture and the exigencies of the marketplace. Decoration is in. Facades are laden with classical moldings, keystones, and columns, or they're masked in super slick mirror glass and high tech color and chrome. Another phenomena that seems peculiar to this time and place is the emergence of architectural drawing as an art object. Indeed, drawings seem to be uh, postmodernism's major output. The movement has relatively few built examples. And in fact, New York galleries are full of sketches from the masters, bold visionary cartoons, highly mannered colored elevations, and even working drawings. Ever since the Museum of Modern Art in New York presented a stunning show of Beaux-Arts watercolor drawings in 1978, everyone has been very busy churning out precious paper. Architectural drawings, especially the visionary sort, have a long and celebrated tradition. From Piranesi to Le Corbusier, drawings have always had a special power and profound influence. The difference here is that a market has been created. The drawings are sold and collected, not for the most part because they're seminal and important, but rather because they're thought to be pretty. These potent and seductive images have a tendency to distance one from the architecture. Most or many of these alleged projects will not be built and were never intended to be built. They occupy a no man's land. They aren't really architecture. They're not really painting. They're merely pretty pictures. And the danger here is that they're still very powerful, very influential, especially for students of architecture. Specifically, the preponderance of the elevation as the most accessible two-dimensional expression of the design incites a kind of obsession with the facade. This, in turn, de-emphasizes the plan and section, the more abstract drawings, in which spatial exploration is the subject. This, again, is quite within the neoclassical tradition. The representational, the pictorial dominate the scene. It seems regrettable to me 
that we must return to a former time so wholeheartedly, putting aside the technological advances that have freed us to such an unprecedented extent. The free plan, the free facade, the separation of structure and skin, the whole formal basis of the modern movement fostered a new kind of volumetric exploration, one that seems to hold even more possibilities. Okay, this is where I come in. Can I have the slides, please? You have perhaps noted a certain skepticism in my discussion of postmodernists. I've been dubbed a postmodernist but I must admit the title chops more than a little bit. I am not a pure die-hard modernist, yet I cannot believe that the great promise and richness of some of the formal tenets of modernism have been exhausted, which is what the term postmodernism implies. My work does not lie within the neoclassical tradition. I reject the representational and embrace the abstract. My sources include many from the history of architecture, but my quotes and allusions are never literal. My meanings are always internalized. My metaphors purely architectural. I'm still taken with the poetics of modernism, the beauty and utility of technology. Mine is a preoccupation with space, not abstract space, not scaleless space, but space whose order and definition are related to light, to human scale, and to the culture of architecture. Architecture is vital and enduring because it contains us. It describes space, space we move through, exist in, and use. I work with volume and surface. I manipulate forms in light, changes of view and scale, movement and stasis. My primary ordering principles have to do with a kind of purity that derives in part from the inherent distinction between the man-made and the natural, a distinction that serves to reunite the two in a relationship of complementary. I see man's intervention as an aesthetic organization of the environment. I seek to impose a coherent system of mutually dependent values, a harmonious relationship of parts. By this, I mean a resolution of all the interlocking issues of form, function, and fitness. Above all, there has to be a reciprocal involvement between the concept for a building and its physical manifestation, rather than mimicry or pastiche. The classic problem is the adaption of ideal archetypes to the contingencies of real life. As Alberti said, beauty in architecture consists of integrating the proportions of all parts of a building in so precise a way that every part has its absolutely fixed size and shape, and nothing can be added or taken away without destroying the harmony of the whole. My rigor also is a search for clarity. This search for me begins with the plan. The plan which seems to have been neglected of late is in fact the key. This two-dimensional image contains within it the instructions for the three-dimensional object that is the building. Together with a section, it generates the building. 
Well, the elevation tends to pictorialize. The plan and section speak to the architect about spatial ideas. But the plan is the most convincing and fundamental expression of architectural ideas. I do believe that buildings should speak. In my work, the use of specific and internally consistent vocabulary of elements and themes over the years has allowed me a coherent evolutionary means of expression. If my vocabulary has to some degree remained unchanged, the process by which I manipulate and assemble this vocabulary has become more complex and comprehensive an intellectual development which has coincided with a growing scope and complexity of more recent commissions. In the beginning, or in the beginning of my practice anyway, <laughs> the design of a number of private houses that you've seen here has provided me with an excellent opportunity to develop my ideas about architecture. Within them, I was able to test my vocabulary and set of values. And in the larger projects, of the past 10 years, the contexts have varied greatly, ranging from virtually freestanding and autonomous buildings, as in the case of the Athenaeum or the Bronx Development Center, to ones which had to be fitted very tightly into an urban fabric, such as the housing at Twin Parks in the Bronx which is almost, which is the next slide. Shown here. However, despite the disparity of scale and program, interre interrelated ideas about the basic dialogue between public and private space have emerged in all of these. In particular, the notion of architectural promenade. Spatial sequence, also a fundamentally urban conception, has been a constant in my work. Buildings are rarely completely isolated objects, and invariably the context has played a major role in my designs. By context, I refer not only to physical environment, but to social typological and historical milieu. The two basic approaches I've explored here at Twin Parks are those of figure ground and object texture. Both are direct responses to what is usually a very powerful context. Now, at the Bronx Developmental Center, shown here, the surroundings were powerful, but decidedly in a negative way. <laughs> the triangular site in the Bronx occupies part of a blighted no man's land. It's a traffic island bounded by a parkway on one side and a network of railroad tr tracks on the other. It's isolated on an elongated rise within an otherwise flat and amorphously organized uh, hospital campus. It has no defining features from which to derive a set of design propositions. So the new building could not be related to its context in a conventional way. I believe that in being sensitive to context and seeking values in it, one must also know when not 
to refer to it. Sometimes a decision to turn one's back on a negative context can become a positive gesture. This became the strategy here in the Bronx to allow the new structure to create its own context, to mitigate the negative surround through the provision of a positive one. And so the complex opens inward to an inviting reality where the resident is shielded from the hostile landscape. This is a total care facility for mentally handicapped people. And it's at once a school, it's a hospital, it's a home for people ranging in age from seven to 70. And our design sought to create a sense of place that would respond to the special feelings and needs of these residents, needs which to a large extent are very different from the needs and visions of most people. Of course, the issue of typology is present in any work of architecture. My own attitude toward typology has to do with the use of history to identify principles of form, spatial organization, construction, and so forth, which may be applied flexibly to analogous contemporary design problems. In this sense, the history of architecture becomes not so much a grab bag of horrible images as a source of ideas and method. In the Bronx, the program seemed in many ways akin to that of a monastery. Like the monastery, the Bronx Developmental Center is a kind of city in microcosm. It contains a sequence of specific social places, each with its distinctive formal qualities. Thus, the complex has its own particular urban morphology, which addresses the nature of the program and certain architectural notions about sequence and form. Three separate elements make up the composition, and these are drawn together by means of various types of connective tissue. The support services wing, shown here, houses the administrative function and has an official public character and scale and, and forms a vast wall, whereas the uh, residential units in response to the hard, unyielding quality of the support services wing are L-shaped and step back slightly toward the north. These buildings are more domestic in scale, more in scale with the sort of Bronx four-story apartment houses, and uh, are thought to be much like interconnected apartment buildings. The third element, the courtyard spaces, consists of vast external rooms carved and sculpted into the terrain. And these are thought of as private worlds which function as a three-dimensional play playground offering alternate aspects, quiet and active, hard and soft, green and white. This terrain is articulated by a landfill that cuts across the center of the complex. It's a differentiating wall that half conceals one side of the open space from the other. The surface of the building was treated as another opportunity to convey functional and conceptual ideas. The aluminum panel and glass curtain wall was not only modified to meet the specific light requirements of various sectors of the center, but the external skin was coated to express the system of organization. This elevational code was layered through the public 
to the more private areas of the residential units and then through and into the two large sheltered courtyards. The public realms, for instance, the entry, uh, uh, the dining hall, the lecture hall, and uh, gymnasium have mullioned or vertically paneled curtain walls and appear more open and penetrable than the private ones, which have smaller openings and tauter walls. And this syntax is further defined by the location of the glass plane in relation to the surface. In the public areas, it's set back from the face, and in the private areas, it's set flush. And in this way, the concept of a progression from public to private is established and reinforced through the nuance of surface detail. The design of the Bronx Developmental Center differentiated through a sequential transformation of type, texture, and circulation between the public zones of street and administrative areas on one hand and the private zones of courtyards and residential units on the other. This dialogue between public and private is less pronounced, and in fact it's non-existent in the design of the Athenaeum in New Harmony, Indiana, shown here. The Athenaeum is a public building. There are no private realms to unfold. In this case, the context played a much more direct and positive role in the shaping of the design. There were two very rich contexts to contend with. The immediate physical one of the beautiful rolling field of the site itself, and the more general historical one of the town of New Harmony. Historically, New Harmony was one of the most significant utopian communities in America and one of the important precedents in the search for an architecture that would mirror the evolution of a society toward its own vision of harmony. The building in its role as a visitor's orientation center, had to relate both to New Harmony's spiritual patrimony and to its modern students. It had to be once part of the town and separate from it. It had to be a threshold through which one passes in preparation and anticipation. The, the site of the Athenaeum is in a field on the edge of the town along the banks of the Wabash River. And in the spring, April or May, uh, when the field floods, the building, which is built on a podium of earth, floats above the water. Uh, one might think of it like an object from another context and time, like a porcelain panel boat of knowledge docking on New Harmony shores, but that may be stretching it. <laughs> <laughs> At any event, <laughs> if 
for those who've been there, you know that New Harmony itself is a set piece. It's a, a phenomena of preservation. Therefore, the Athenaeum does not attempt to be like what surrounds it. It addresses spirit, not literal substance. But it's also very much part of the spatial continuum leading from the water's edge to the center of the town. It is, in fact, both the... That, those slides got in by mistake. They're out of order, I'm sorry. Uh, the Athenaeum is, in fact, both the beginning and a kind of distillation of the path that ultimately leads into the heart of the historical experience. Thus, because the town can be approached as both a contemporary place and a historical event, the building is conceived in terms of linked ideas of architectural promenade and historical path. As the town's actual and symbolic link with the water and the outside world, the building is a place of arrival, a giant portal. A visitor arriving by boat, which is very rare, is deposited on a path that leads up through the field to the building. On reaching the podium, the water route is joined by a landed counterpart, which is entry from the parking lot. And here there is a three-story plane which is set at a 40-degree angle from the predominant orthogonal grid of the building to acknowledge the real point of arrival. And it conveys to the visitor the actual portal, the doorway, which is shifted five degrees in orientation in order to announce the primary grid of the building. Meanwhile, the many-sided facade of the building also gestures to aspects of the landscape. For example, the section of wall oriented to the river is a curved fluid ribbon of glass that one might say speaks of the water form. Once the visitor has crossed the threshold, the entry box, uh, he is propelled to the space at the foot of the internal circulation ramp. Circulation is the main spatial protagonist of this building, and the ramp is its most vital element. As this ramp winds upward from the orthogonal grid and regains the five degree offset orientation of the path from the river, one might say the entire building is set in motion and the geometry of overlaid grids induces a compression of spaces at certain points and an attention at others. For example, when the outside ramp, which extends along the south elevation, approaches the interior ramp perpendicularly, the five degree shift makes itself particularly felt. One circular circulation path is inflected toward another. At this point, there's a kind of collision. And uh, here, the ramp, which straddles the space, in which all of the geometries come together, and which is illuminated by light from above, resolves both grids in plan and section. The ramp then goes from up to the second level to an exhibition space which contains a model of Old New Harmony, which is lit by uh, a, a canon skylight. And from here, 
the frame views to the exterior serve as orienting devices operating between the building and the town it serves. Aside from the major ramp, there are many itineraries for historical and architectural exploration in this building. There are, these are sometimes marked by the skylights and by the shifting wall planes and by changing floor and ceiling heights. And then upon reaching the exhibition space on the third level, the visitor can look back on the internal route that he's traveled through interior slots which frame the essential spaces and can also look forward to what's to come. And from here the visitor moves out onto the rooftop and the upper level roof terraces where the routes of egress take them past these various planes and screen walls which continually refer to and refract the landscape. The landscape is, in fact, very much part of this building. At the uppermost roof terrace, the visitor finds himself confronted with the town. This small space affords a panoramic view, like from the prow of a ship, and it's both the culmination and the anticipation of moving through the town. It's like a, a widow's walk. It, it holds vigil over the town. It reinforces the ideological and the actual axis that joins the restored harmonist log cabins, the pottery shed, Philip Johnson's roofless church, and the commemorative garden built in Paul Tillich's honor. The long step ramp then leads the visitor out of the building toward New Harmony. Okay, the next project which I uh, would like to show you the most recently completed building is the Hartford Seminary. This is still the Athenaeum. This is the Hartford Seminary. Uh, this is a, an interdenominational continuing education and research center for both clergy and laymen. The directors wanted a single new structure that would encompass its new diversified program and would serve the seminary's dual function as a public organization devoted to encouraging religious understanding of the world at large and a private inward looking place for contemplation. The partee consists of an L-shaped structure which partially encloses an entry courtyard and a gateway on axis with the main door suggests a ritual passage into sanctuary, at once a vestige of the cloister and an inviting gesture to visitors. Major public spaces are at the extremities of the L, and private areas such as the offices and uh, small classrooms fill in the interstices, with some areas overlooking or projected into the major spaces. In keeping with the democratic principles upon which the seminary is based, the only hierarchy here is an architectural one. Public spaces dominate private ones. And among private spaces, no hierarchical distinctions are made. Public spaces are arrayed sequentially. The institutions need to provide 
at transition from the worldly and mundane to the ordered intellectual and spiritual life within was an opportunity to explore notions of architectural sequence and promenade. As the seminary encourages understanding and participation, so the building attempts to accomplish the same ends by the means of the way in which it projects from interior to exterior space. And this occurs both in plan and section. The chapel provides a symbolic focus for the building, even if it's not the literal center of activity. The fundamental concept behind the chapel design was a belief that the common element in all houses of worship is, as Lou Kahn said, a, a coming together under light. The building is intended to be a, a of multi-directional light to define space assumes meaning in the seminary as, as a symbol of learning and community and reflects the orientation of the building toward both public and private concerns. This is uh, the Museum for Kunsthandwerk in Frankfurt. I believe that the city, like smaller works of architecture, primarily consists of public and private spaces and the spaces in between. But unlike architectural works of lesser scale and complexity, the urban design particularly in European cities, contains the dynamic of history. It's a given for the architect, a, a variable confrontation. The city forces a historical spatial dialogue. In the Museum for Kunsthandwerk, the attempt is made to make this dialogue highly, highly articulate. Here, the notion of context is expanded to take in not only physical and programmatic concerns, but also the respective historical context of site and building type. The parti developed from an intense response to this combined context, and the basic form was determined largely by the structure of the city itself. A reaction against the 20th century tendency to isolate buildings as freestanding objects which ignore their surrounds, this scheme not only responds to, but it intensifies, it enlarges, it reinforces the public context and the urban fabric. Building and urban form are one. The neoclassical Villa Metzler the building which existed on the site uh, is a relic from the age of Goethe and Schenkel. And in this photo montage, the building on the left, and it contained the city's decorative art treasures ever since the end of World War II. This is one of eight museums on the south bank of the Mine River overlooking the center of the city. And the three-story stucco mansion, which was built in 1803, has provided the gallery space for 
an extensive collection of European and decorative Western art, but uh, the space is totally inadequate. So the new building which is needed is roughly nine times the size of the present museum. Besides preserving and connecting to the villa, the museum extension relates to the neighboring museums along this continuous riverside embankment called the Museum Sufer. And this museum is conceived of as an urban bridge, a pedestrian link between the residential quarter of Sachsenhausen on one side and the commercial district of Frankfurt across the mine. The hip-roofed Villa Metzler, as you can see in the site plan on the left, occupies one quarter, one corner of an open courtyard which is connected by a glass walled bridge to the new structure. The new building as, is massed as a cluster of low pavilions around two courtyards and conforms to the scale of the nearby houses and it acknowledges a relationship to the different orientation of its neighbors on, on all sides. That's another photo montage. The building is just starting construction. This was a, a model. Now, as an aside, we'll come back to the, this, but this is a, a different project. Uh, our renovation of the Villa Strozzi in Florence in 1973 where we also address the problem of integrating old and new. In Florence, however, our approach was just the reverse of that in Frankfurt. In Florence, we left two walls of the old shell to enclose and define the new museum which was going to be inserted into it. The old was modified to contain the new. In Florence, the old building forms an enclosure for the new one, so that the 19th century building becomes a kind of shell that encases the modern uh, building. This wasn't built. In Frankfurt, shown here, the opposite takes place. For in Frankfurt, we've taken the elementary four-sided proportions of the villa plan and the orthogonal pattern of its facades and repeated them as modules at, every, at nearly every level of the design, from the axial circulation system of the basic part T to the detailed development of the facade. And here in the diagrams on the right, you can see that uh, the new structure replicates and projects the geometry of the villa's basic cubic dimensions at several scales, so that the villa's 17.6 meter width and height become the basis for the exterior dimensions of each quadrant while the elevational proportions of the villa become the source of the width and height of the windows uh, and the, all of the proportions of the skylight, the window, the wall panels, the paving blocks, and everything else. At the same time that there's a projection of the geometry of the villa, of the villa there is an acknowledgment of the new building's relationship to the different orientation of its neighbors on all of the sides. And by rotating the basic square plan three and a half degrees to align with the facades of all of the other museums, the seven other museums along the river embankment, and by shifting its axis by the same measure, we're able to establish a frontal relationship with all of the other buildings on the embankment, and we are also able to introduce 
a subtle diagonal tension within the otherwise orthogonal grid. This overlaying of grids allows for a reconciliation between site vectors and, and formal organization. And within the plan itself, this displacement of the major axis causes an inflection toward the entrance from the park on the left and thereby accentuates the diagonal path which is made by the major pedestrian route through the site connecting the residential streets behind the museum to the river embankment and connecting them to the footbridge which crosses the mine river. This pedestrian route intersects with other routes in a miniature public square whose form is determined by the fragmentation of the original grid and the creation of an open courtyard which is based on the diagonal grid. I uh, really need to take longer to, to explain this uh, in detail. But the square plan, as you can see, echoes the square plan of the villa and also uh, of the complex as a whole. And it, it also allows uh, the mandatory requirement that all of the uh, existing trees on the site be preserved. And it provides a transition and a gateway between the private life of the domestically scaled residential community of Sachsenhausen and the public life of the monumentally scaled institution. Now, this is a, another aside because th since this is just beginning to be built, I wanted to show you the organization of, the, of an interior uh, which is similar in some respects to what we're going to be doing at Frankfurt. And this is an installation which we did in 1977 for a show uh, of New York School painters and sculptors. And at that time, in seeking ways to make the exhibited objects, some of which were huge in scale, in seeking ways to make them visible, we discovered that the ideal point of view in uh, in looking at any work of art was in fact not singular but multiple and in general it's most desirable to be able to see a work of art close up and then move away and see it again from a distance allowing one to savor an unexpected glimpse back at objects already seen or previews of objects yet to be seen and as uh, at Frankfurt, uh, the intent is that the architect, uh, that the architecture conduct the visitor through a prescribed didactic and evocative sequence, which is arranged uh, uh, more or less chronologically. Uh, and at Frankfurt, instead of assembling period rooms, the surroundings will be kind of a, a Bedecker of the decorative arts. And there will be interior windows and circulation routes through the galleries uh, positioned so that exhibits are sometimes perceived obliquely, partially, or from a distance. Now, in the Enlightenment period, the role of museums was expanded to include educational as well as collection and display functions. This and uh, the next museum uh, in Atlanta, uh, I would like to think, are in this tradition, for they not only acknowledge their function of housing art, but perhaps contribute 
to a museum's education role, uh, educational role in the broadest sense. They're intended to provide, as here in, a, 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 in the model photograph of the Atlanta Museum, uh, an ambience conducive both to viewers' contemplative moments and to their immediate appreciation and discovery of a collection uh, of a collection's aesthetic values. The role of the architect uh, is seen as to encourage people to use the museum to experience the art of architecture as well as the art displayed in it. As these institutions are committed to art education, to the pursuit of a modern form of cultural illumination, their architecture should be both literally and symbolically radiant. They should contain and reflect light, and in this way be an expression of a museum's purposes in our time. Now, the program for the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, Georgia, shown here, uh, called for a building uh, containing exhibition areas for the museum's permanent collection, uh, as well as a 200-seat auditorium, a cafe, gift shop, uh, children's gallery, educational workshops, etc. The primary requirement was flexibility in the display of the collections, and in particular, an organization that would permit sufficient space for accommodating almost any size of traveling exhibition. Uh, at the ground level on the right, uh, well, we missed the ground level, uh, but there is an exterior ramp that leads one from Peachtree Street to the main entry space, which is adjacent to the central atrium. Uh, and the atrium is a core of the building and, and is encircled by ramps which lead up to the various gallery levels shown here. And although this is one building, it's also two buildings. It's a museum proper and an auditorium. And there's a, a kind of double response created by the semi detached auditorium. One of the important aspects of this pro project is uh, that it, it is uh, really an inward organization of space, a building which, although uh, it looks out, really turns in and concerns itself with spaces which are interrelated to one another. And the visitor can understand this relationship as he circulates through the building. The atrium, shown on the left, is the major element in the design and the function of this building. It's an element which has not been in, in previous projects. And the building is designed around this atrium as the organizing space. Since all of the gallery spaces revolve around the, the skylit atrium. There is here the possibility of seeing a work of art within a gallery space close up, coming around on the ramp, seeing it again from a different perspective or a different vista in relationship to other things. And in this way, visitors will be offered a variety of perspectives from which to view the art, and also a full panorama of the interior circulation of the building. Well, as you all know, uh, fatigue is really the deadly en enemy of any rewarding museum visit. And here, a variety of light, spaces, scale, and views 
attempt to uh, enliven this overall experience and the organization of the building as I mentioned really revolves around the center space the atrium space so that the visitor can exercise choice and variety in movements while always maintaining uh, one's orientation the essential urban dialogue takes place between type and incident between public and private between fabric and discontinuity between history and the present moment I believe it's possible to see most of my work as a sequence of investigations into the spatial interchange between public and private realms this interchange expresses itself in varying conceptions but is always related in some way to the notion of architectural promenade to the idea of passage finally and again mine is a, an attempt to find and redefine a sense of order to understand then a relationship between what has been and what can be to extract from our culture both the timeless and the topical this to me is the basis of style the decision to include or exclude choice the final exercise of the individual will and intellect in this way my style is something that is born out of culture and yet is profoundly connected with personal experience but to gain any sense of my involvement it's necessary to consult my work fundamentally my meditations are on space form light and how to make them my goal is presence not illusion I pursue it with unrelenting vigor I believe it is the heart and soul of architecture thank you Any questions? They are welcome. Okay. Uh, if not, we will see everybody in Butterfield. Thank you.